All right, hello. <laughs> Hey everybody, thank you so much for coming out and joining us today. I hope you're all having a great time here at reInvent. And I want to welcome you to our session today. This is uh, SEC 321, how ZocDoc achieved automatic threat detection and remediation with security as code. And my name is Danielle Ruderman, and I am with the AWS Security Organization. And I am very excited to be here today to present our speakers. We have Brian Lozada, who's now behind me. <laughs> the Chief Information Security Officer for ZocDoc. And we also have Jay Ball, who is the Head of Application Security for ZocDoc. And we were actually very fortunate to welcome ZocDoc to the stage uh, here at reInvent last year, where they presented a security session on how ZocDoc achieves security and compliance using infrastructure as code. And that session is available on YouTube, and I definitely recommend that you check it out, because it has some great information in it. So we have infrastructure as code, and we have security as code. And of course, all of this is automation. And I will tell you that automation is a subject that is very near and dear to our hearts at AWS, and is something we invest in very heavily ourselves. And you may have heard our own Chief Information Security Officer, Steve Schmidt, talk about how we need to keep humans away from data. And why do we need to keep humans away from data? Well, we humans can be a little troublesome, and if nothing else, we are imperfect, and we make mistakes. So we use automation to take humans out of the equation so we can be more secure. But the other benefit of automation is that you can free up your most valuable resources, who are your security engineers, to focus on those higher judgment tasks. And when your security engineers have that kind of bandwidth, they can start looking at some of the challenges facing your organization and come up with really innovative solutions for you. And if you can create a culture in your companies where your security engineers can be builders and they can innovate and find new creative solutions, you'll have an easier time finding and retaining talent, which frankly in this industry is a bit of a challenge. So this is kind of exciting. And I will add that one of the great things about this session that uh, Brian and Jay have pulled together is that a lot of the code and the solutions you will see here today are publicly available on their GitHub repository. And you'll get a link to that at the end of this session. And when I asked Brian why a company like ZocDoc is so committed to publicly sharing their solutions and their code with all of you, he said, well, security takes a village. And all of you here are part of that village. And I really hope that you can take the ideas and inspiration from this session back to your own companies and work with your security teams on ways to automate your work. And then I hope you can then turn around and take those ideas and those learnings and contribute back to repositories like those at ZocDoc so we can all work together as a security community with AWS to keep our data secure and to find those really innovative solutions for our customers and also to give our security teams the opportunity to become builders and find those innovative solutions. And I think we can all then work together to really change how security is perceived and really take it from being a blocker to an enabler for the business. And that really allows you to fundamentally change how you're thinking about and approaching security and can really drive change in the industry for the better. So without further ado, Brian Lozada, take it away. Thank you, Danielle, appreciate it. Good afternoon, my name is Brian Lozada. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for ZocDoc. And I'm excited to talk to you guys today about how we are doing automated, automatic threat detection and remediation. But before we get into that, I wanna talk a little bit about what ZocDoc is, our mission, and how we got here. So ZocDoc is a New York-based technology company that focuses on modernizing healthcare by removing the friction we all experience in healthcare. We feel the 21st century patient should have more options when it comes to choosing their healthcare provider. They should have better access to the healthcare provider. And more importantly, they should be able to book with that healthcare provider quickly. We feel technology should be the vehicle that drives that shift for the patient to take control over their healthcare needs and give power back to the patient. Solving the access problem is a core component to ZocDoc's mission. What you're looking at here is the average wait time in days for a patient to actually get to see a primary care physician. Think about some of these numbers, 122 days, 109 days, 42 days. To think about in 2018, this is absolutely unacceptable. With ZocDoc, we're actually able to reduce that. The average ZocDoc patient, from the moment they search for a doctor to the moment they actually go see the doctor, is 24 hours. And how we're able to do that is that there is a hidden supply of care. 
about 30% of doctor's availability goes unbooked, rescheduled, or it's canceled. ZocDoc's able to take that inventory and put it on our marketplace. About six million patients a month use our service to search and book for doctors today. We began supplying care for the 21st century patient, focusing on local practices, local doctors, and then right after that, we started partnering with large health systems. These large health systems wanted to take advantage of marketplace efficiencies to drive patients in as well. And at this particular point, we quickly realized that our current technology stack was not gonna be able to handle our growth. So we thought, how can we get a technology stack that could be optimized for the growth we were about to go through? And we came up with this concept of ZocDoc 2.0, and that was actually going 100% to AWS. We came up with that concept in 2016, and by 2017, we were 100% all the way in AWS, shutting down all data centers. Some of the top goals that we had for this was scaling horizontally so we can keep pace with our growth. Second was diversify our tech stack. We wanted to be able to leverage all new emerging technology. That drives innovation, but it also allows us to think about when you're limited in technology and you don't diversify your technology, you're very predictable. And a predictable force is a defeatable force. And that's something that we were just not willing to accept. The next thing was we want to take advantage of open source technology and also contribute to the open source community. That drives innovation as well, but it also attracts talent. Next, we wanted to unlock the power of data. We have a lot of data, and we wanted to be able to quickly analyze that data to help drive product innovation and also solve those patient needs that we had. And selfishly, I wanted to elevate security in this shift over to, to AWS. Seeing that this, these were our goals, there was no way we were just gonna do a lift and shift. We could not just do a lift and shift in, into AWS. We needed to, one, rethink how we were doing things, but more importantly, re-architect our entire technology stack so that we can go 100% to AWS. Seeing that security was such a key component to our migration, securing the cloud infrastructure with speed was one thing, but two, without slowing down our development organization. And we chose infrastructure as code as the mechanism to actually do that. The first area we tackled was looking at AMIs, having hardened AMIs that we actually put standards in, like using Packer for automatic patching, logging agents, host space IDS, antivirus already packaged up in there, and making it immutable and untouchable. Next thing we wanted to do to speed up our deployment pipeline was using containers and Docker to control that. Next was encryption. Actually leveraging things like KMS to generate and, and, and uh, rotate our keys. Also using Cloud HSM for storage and access of those keys. Next was tackling the access control problem. When you're in a data center, sometimes you inherit a lot of access and you don't really think about it. This was a great opportunity for us to look at our access controls and get very granular. Even segmenting environments between sensitive data and non-sensitive data. And lastly, we wanted to do policy control. Ensuring that everything we were putting in place was all temp templatized out with CloudFormation, all wrapped up with an Ansible, pushing it out with TeamCity. After we had this environment, you know, everything built out, we looked at, let's get our environment certified and validated. And shortly after our migration, we were able to achieve not just our SOC 2 type 2 compliance, but high trust compliance. And for those of you in healthcare, you know that high trust is the highest level of security and compliance you can achieve. This is all on top of AWS. Once we had this environment, our developers started looking at the data that we had been collecting, and they discovered a pain point when it came to uh, patients booking with doctors. The pain point that, that they discovered was that patients didn't understand their insurance cards. Who can interpret their insurance card to say, my doctor's in network and I know what the copay is? So this is something that Health they actually came up with. insurance is complicated. Here, take a look at your insurance card. What's your plan name? That one? Or that one? That one sounds familiar. What about your member ID number? So many numbers. Is that it? What about your copay? <laughs> it's not you. Everybody deals with this. And if we can't find basic information, how can we answer harder questions like, is this doctor in network? 
Does my insurance even cover this? It's a headache, and not just for patients. Doctors struggle with bad information too, and end up having to turn people away. It isn't healthy for anybody. That's why ZocDoc created Insurance Checker. Just snap a picture of your card, and Insurance Checker decodes what's important, so you can find a doctor that's actually in your network. Pick your doctor, and we'll make sure your insurance is valid, confirm all your details, and share the exact information the doctor needs without a single phone call. It's good for doctors. It's good for patients. It's good for anybody who just wants their healthcare to make more sense. Download the ZocDoc app now. It's pretty powerful stuff. When you think about it, when you give developers great technology and a problem, they're able to fix it you know, an absolute pain point that people are facing. And I thought to myself, in security we have these pain points. Can we use some of the, te the technology that AWS offers us to do the same thing and scale security at the pace of innovation? So when you look at, at security for the past 25 years, we've been doing the exact same thing, but expecting different results. And all of us face this, right? We have monitoring as part of our information security program. That's pretty much automated right now. We also have alerting also pretty much automated right now. What isn't automated is that investigative part right there. At that part, a human actually has to take that alert, see how valuable it is, is it something we need to prioritize, and then go ahead and prevent and block it. And I looked at this cycle, and we've all been doing this for many years, and I thought, is it possible for us to actually use AWS services to automate that investigative and preventing and blocking piece of this cycle? So then I looked at some of the, it, I took an inventory of the AWS services and security services that we were taking advantage of. Things like AWS Web Application Firewall and Shield, Trusted Advisor, AWS Guard Duty, which was actually launched last year here at reInvent, CloudWatch, Inspector for Vulnerability Management, CloudTrail. And I thought the output of all of these services, could I use a Lambda function to make that output actionable, to do something? So looking at automation today in AWS, it's automatic monitoring, automatic alerting, and I wanted to use those Lambda functions to complete this and do automatic remediation in what we are calling security as code. In order to do this, I needed to find the right talent, partner with the right talent, that shared the same frustration that I had with the security industry, shared the same frustration that we have with vendor fatigue, all security vendors give us the same exact thing. They package it up in different dashboards. I'm tired of dashboards. I don't want a dashboard that's gonna tell me more and more alerting, but it's not gonna fix the problem. So I was fortunate enough to find Jay, who has been a developer for many years. He, some of his code could actually be found in Apache and Mozilla. Uh, Jay has also been uh, a penetration tester for about 10 years, doing pen tests on large financial services and insurance companies. Um, and I, I posed this problem to, to, to Jay, and he would welcome the opportunity to do one thing, build. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, head of application security at ZocDoc, Jay Ball. Um, thanks for recruiting me, Brian. You're um, welcome. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've been a red team pen tester for years. Uh, I did security and compliance audits at the giant big four firm internally and externally uh, for, their, for their customers. And I've been a developer and I still write code and push it out to GitHub um, and sometimes you know, random uh, internal code for myself and my family. So when I came to ZocDoc, the idea was that I want to need to do all three of these, the little bit of security auditing, the development, and pen testing to better the security of ZocDoc and write a bunch of code and give it to you all so you can uh, secure your own systems and try to come up with new ideas uh, that improve security in general. So I come in to work each morning and then I take a look at this guy here and he's pulling his hair out, it's all disheveled overnight because I don't know what nightmares he's been having. So I pose, say, Brian, what kept you up last night? What made you pull your hair out and look like, you know, the lady from Bride of Frankenstein and all that? Great question, Jay. So one of the first things that I asked Jay was, I had the fear of misconfigurations. When you give folks power of technology, there's the opportunity of having a misconfiguration. One thing was unencrypted S3 buckets that are put out there. How can we detect those things and actually remediate them quickly? And I posed that to Jay. Okay, so 
you were reading some magazine for your CISO buddies or something like that overnight, and that's what gave you nightmares. Um, stop. But S3 buckets, they're encrypted, and uh, basically the solution is just to re-encrypt them if they somehow become unencrypted. So we all know how to create an S3 bucket, and we all know that it should be encrypted upon creation. And they stay encrypted until something happens where they are not encrypted. And this could be the spurious uh, command line call, some wacky API call that something goes wrong, or Bob from accounting clicks something. And that just removes our encryption from the bucket. And suddenly we are in violation of uh, various compliance requirements and heck, our data is just not encrypted on disk like it's supposed to be. So how do we solve this? Well, we'll start with our S3 bucket here. And every operation to an S3 bucket logs to CloudTrail. Okay, so now from CloudTrail, what we need to do is leverage CloudWatch to look at the various events from S3, certain types of events, uh, because CloudWatch gives us the ability to trigger on uh, a limited set of events. So if we hit a, an event where the bucket may have its encryption removed, we want to call a Lambda. And what's going to happen with this Lambda is it's going to take a look at the bucket, and then it's going to go ahead and apply encryption if it needs to be applied. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. I mean, let's see if it works. So CloudTrail, if you've never seen it, this is the CloudTrail console for an S3 event. In this case, put bucket ACL uh, came out of an S3 event because somebody changed the ACL on a bucket. And what happens is that CloudWatch then consumes it. And this is a CloudWatch configuration screen. And you see we're looking at the put bucket ACL, create bucket, and even the delete bucket encryption events. If any of those are performed against an S3 bucket, then we go off and call our Lambda function. And what does the Lambda function look like? Well, it runs. So here I am going to give an example of creation of a bucket. Uh, we give it a name because for some reason Amazon requires us to give bucket names that are unique across the DNS zones. Um, I don't know, I want the same bucket name everywhere, but they won't let me. Uh, I save the bucket out and I'm leaving encryption off in this case and I'm just gonna click next. Uh, we continue with our uh, creation process and the bucket gets saved out. And so there it is, it's unencrypted to uh, the cloud. Now we're gonna take a look at the bucket again. Uh, we're gonna look at the properties on the bucket and we see that's not encrypted. But if I just go up and reload the page, now it is encrypted. Uh, this operation, depending on um, the time that you run it, sometimes takes five to 10 seconds. Usually it takes under a second. So sometimes when you go right back to the page, it's already encrypted for you. So this particular demo, when I ran it, it took a few seconds. Uh, but the code, it works, it's there. And the code is not that complicated. So it's a Lambda and CloudWatch invokes this code. Uh, is, is past the event, and from the event, we pull out the bucket name. Great, now let's try to get the encryption on the bucket. And if we get a type, any type of error back, it pretty much means the bucket's not encrypted. So let's just simply apply the encryption, and now the bucket is encrypted. Optionally here, we are sending ourselves an email message over SNS that says, hey, Bill forgot to, did something wrong with the bucket. Go have a talk with him. This is a message. This is not an alert. I'm not alerting. I'm just doing a post-educational thing here uh, because we want to end alerting. I fixed the issue. Uh, if you guys deploy this, uh, delete that line of code. Don't, bother, don't even bother sending yourself a message. Just fix the issue. And that's pretty much it. So I've encrypted it. I've maybe made your hair get all down tonight. Maybe tomorrow you won't be so scary when I come in the morning. Anything else you want, Brian? Not likely. I still have a lot more concerns that I wanted to, why don't you help in addressing? And the next was looking at malicious activity. We have a lot of EC2 instances out there. Uh, Jay, stop playing Pokemon. We got things we gotta be doing right now. Uh, and I, I wanted to see if we could look at how can we automate a finding of malicious activity, let's say a command and control, finding it and fixing it 
before it actually starts using our network to attack other networks, right? So Jay, is that something that we could do with, with AWS services? Okay, so one of our EC2 instances, that would be like a Windows machine, uh, something's wrong with it. It has some sort of uh, software got installed which is calling out to uh, some evil malware website. And remember, all of our EC2 instances are immutable. We just spin them up and if something goes wrong with them, we just terminate them. So if this has a command and control installed on it and it's trying to do something bad, we're just gonna kill the instance. I don't care, it's gone. And we've just removed the infection from our uh, cloud network. So how might this work? Um, well, we have our EC2 instance with a little bit of um, a problem. And uh, what happens is the malware makes a DNS call out to evilsite.com and that gets recorded in guard duty, which was announced last year here at AWS. Um, and guard duty has the same functionality as uh, Cloud Trail does in that CloudWatch can consume these events. So the events get consumed by CloudWatch. If a certain trigger is hit, we call a Lambda, and our Lambda very, very politely euthanizes the EC2 instance, and it's gone. So we've just removed the infection from our cloud. Now, after the fact, we can lose, use the uh, CloudTrail and CloudWatch uh, logs to look to see how did this uh, EC2 get infected. Uh, we use third-party uh, vaulting systems for all of our logs. We can also start looking at those to mine them. If we had some sort of um, um, disk uh, that was saved out, so some attached storage, we can also uh, take a look at that. And this would also be all be done by our forensics team. Uh, but for our operations team, we've just removed the infection. So they can go on with life and then we can review what may have happened to the system later. But for the operational standpoint, we're going, we're good. So we relied on guard duty to help us find this infection. So if you've never seen guard duty, uh, it looks a lot like many other uh, Amazon log sorts of screens. Uh, and in this case, it's recording this sort of uh, event that happened, the command and control. It records many different types of things. So if you've never used it again, turn it on. Uh, it's very easy. Just configure some IAM permissions, flip the switch, and then uh, just watch the data flow in to see maybe what is on your network. Um, configuration for CloudWatch to consume the events is pretty much the same as it was uh, for the S3. You just uh, do your guard duty and then uh, you say what sort of events you're looking for. And uh, what's it look like? Well, here I'm showing my CloudWatch logs are empty. I'm showing that uh, I have an EC2 instance ready to run and uh, I have no guard duty findings. Now I'm gonna SSH into my um, system. I run a canary to trigger the DNS lookup. And to show this is a real demo, of course I get logged out of AWS console and I have to re-log back into the console because this is real. Um, I'm clicking around to make sure, did it work yet? And we hit enter a few times somewhere. And the connection got closed right there because it got killed. Now we look at my logs here and you see that uh, the event was triggered uh, from guard duty it says, and if we scroll down a little bit more, we see that the back door was hit because I, I activated the canary to trigger it. Uh, look at my guard duty findings and there it is. The back door shows up in my logs and my EC2 is uh, stopped. Uh, guard duty is not instantaneous. I will tell everyone that right now. That demo took an hour 10 to record and for your viewing convenience, I did slice out all of the extra uh, hour nine minutes. Um, I've done this demo before and recorded it and it took 10 minutes to happen. So uh, your mileage will vary depending on who knows what, but uh, guard duty does work, but sometimes it is not instantaneous. Just remember that. Um, what did the code look like to kill the EC2 instance? Well, remember, I'm about to uh, power off a machine. So I really want to make sure that I'm the correct caller and I'm calling for the proper reasons because uh, guard duty detects many things. I only want it to, do, to uh, power off a machine for really, really bad things like this command and control thing. So we do some sanity checks here. Uh, the next step is we need to get the instance ID out. 
And on top of it, not all instances can, are immutable. So we have a tag called security guillotine. If that tag is set on an EC2 instance, I know I can just kill it. Uh, otherwise, um, this, the, this process will just return it, will not kill it. And then after we've done these sanity checks, shut it down. It's gone. Uh, you can also do, um, so I did stop instance here on this screen, but you can also do a shutdown instance, and it will do the much more polite uh, powering off the system. It's up to you guys what you want to do when you deploy this code. Um, so that's really it for guard duty. I have killed your command and control. Are you finally satisfied? Can I catch Pikachu? Focus just a little bit more and just have a few more questions. Uh, what about, aside from command and control, what other things can guard duty detect and can we automate with, with our security as code? Okay, well, the documentation for guard duty has many, many things in it. Um, maybe 50 to 100 different things. However, for the really, really bad things, I've put them up there on the screen. And these are the things that we really should kill the instance for because there's a, some sort of infection on it. Uh, and in this case, the way we did it is just modify the Python code that you saw earlier, just add this to the array, and then also uh, modify the CloudWatch code. Uh, so that way CloudWatch will trigger on these events. Please read the documentation for guard duty. It detects a lot. Really bad stuff and really mm, not as bad, but maybe you wanna look at it stuff. So that's guard duty. And can I get a beer now? Maybe, maybe. I have one, one more thing. Actually, I got a few more things. Uh, going back to mis misconfigurations and thinking about uh, sensitive ports. What if we have an incident that uh, we open up an environment that actually has like an SSH port open to the internet or Telnet port open to the internet? That's something we don't want. How can we actually detect that and close that port down? Do you even know what port number SSH is? Can we take that offline and maybe talk about it after? Okay, so somebody opens a sensitive port to the internet, 22, and you want them to not do that. So why don't we just modify the security group that somebody misconfigured and remove port 22? Okay, so how does this work? I'm sensing a design pattern here. We make a modification to our security groups it gets logged into CloudTrail. We have a bunch of triggers in CloudWatch to detect this modification. If uh, the right trigger is hit, we call our Lambda, and then our Lambda goes off and modifies the security group to remove the bad CIDR. Hey, that good design pattern, looks like it works. So uh, what's it look like? Well, again, CloudTrail, create security group is something that we can log on that would be appropriate for this. Um, the CloudWatch configuration, uh, if you wanna change an ingress or create the security group, it sounds like a good time to call our Lambda. Uh, and well, let's watch it in action here. So um, just showing that my logs are empty to make the demo more realistic. Uh, and we go in and we're gonna create our security group. and. Uh, for this demo, port 54321, I'm calling sensitive uh, just to make the demo a little easier here. So we add it to the ingress, uh, and then we're also going to make sure that it's accessible from the entire internet. And then we go off and we save our port. So my security group has now been modified, it has been updated, it has been saved to the cloud. There it is, great. What happens when I refresh the screen? It disappeared, so that was very instantaneous. Um, we look at the log here, and then we see that uh, I have an ingress rule violation uh, recorded, and this was what uh, the code that uh, we wrote uh, made into the logs. So we have uh, removed it. Now some of you will say, but if an administrator was adding port 22 so they could get to the machine, and uh, well, you just removed the ingress, now they can't get to the machine. Frankly, I don't care, because they just opened up port 22 to, to the whole world. They should have opened it correctly only from the VPN or from a single IP address. They can go back in and fix it correctly. So that's my argument uh, back if somebody complains. Uh, the code, fairly similar. Uh, make sure that we're the correct caller and for the correct reasons again. 
Um, depending on the reason for uh, calling this either the create group or the authorize the ingress, um, we have to figure out our security group ID from two different spots in the JSON. It's just the, the way um, AWS configured the calling. So figure that out. Then all of this uh, wonderfully easy to read code determines if we have explicitly specified a port number, put a range on a port number, or we specified minus one meaning all ports. So this is just to determine if a port is sensitive. And finally, if we have a sensitive port, and we have uh, the open internet IP address, then that means we need to revoke the ingress. And so we just call it revoke ingress. And now it's gone. So we've just uh, removed the uh, open port 22 on uh, the security groups. And we've protected our EC2 from probing login external attack from the open internet. So is that answer? 22 or 25 or any other port numbers that you think are sensitive? For the record, I did know what port 22 was, okay? Okay. Right. But I still have more, more concerns. Uh, uh, we, in the security industry, like I, I mentioned earlier, sometimes we're at the mercy of vendors and, and security vendors. And I started looking at our web application firewall that we were using. And I thought AWS now offers a, a web application firewall and DDoS service. Is there something that we could do to take advantage of this service so that I could limit or I could eliminate my, my dependency on, on, on that third party, but doing more with automation with, with, with this WAF? And I pose that to Jay and see what he can come up with. Okay. So part of this was um, you were writing a very, very large checkout the other day that you did not want to write that uh, I would prefer you wrote to me to yeah. pay this third party vendor. And um, That is correct. <laughs> what you want to do is save money. Maybe not give it to me, but I can try. Um, so why don't we, let's leverage. Amazon gives us a WAF. Let's see what their WAF can do. So we have to, before you deploy any WAF solution, you have to look at what you already have. So we already have a WAF. Um, and right now it was configured in such a way that we need to have one configuration per external facing website that we have. So, and for us, that means nine different management cases. So our operations team has to manage nine different things. And we can't share rules between each of these management things. So if we're being attacked from an IP address, we want to block this IP address. And then I have to go in and block it in eight other places, which is a bit annoying. Uh, and then our WAF doesn't support reputation blacklists. And that's the idea where we call off to various other parties on the internet. They have catalog a bunch of IP addresses that are naughty all the time, and we just never want them to even allow to connect to us. And we want to start using that sort of automation too. Grab this reputation list, add it, and just auto block things. So we never even get hit. So how did we do this? And uh, we used something very simple. Amazon's own WAF security automations. I believe this was introduced at reInvent two years ago, and this is what we started with. Um, this diagram was introduced two years ago, and I recommend everyone start here, and this is what we did. Now, we made some modifications on top of this because uh, we had some um, custom requirements. Uh, first off, for a lot of regulatory reasons, we need to block certain countries. We just don't allow them to get to reach our network, uh, even our external facing website. Um, we need to add some specialty whitelisting because we have some input data that looks like cross-site scripting attacks, so we have to whitelist a certain set of um, URIs to allow this data to come in. Uh, we have to blacklist a few endpoints on our network because we have a bunch of obsolete um, endpoints and we have some orphaned user agents running out there in the wild trying to access, and we just, we just blacklist all of this so that way our EC2s never even get the traffic, just saves us headaches. Uh, the other thing we made changes to was the reputationless parsing logic. Amazon wrote the code, I sped it up and made it a bit better. And there's one other thing we had to do is remove something that the uh, security automations that AWS wrote gives you, and that was the bad honeypot rule. Unfortunately, there are limitations 
in Amazon's WAF solution, and I had to lose a rule, and the rule I chose to uh, do away with was the, the bad honeypot. The biggest thing we did is we implemented a dual WAF system. So we've got web servers, we've got API servers. They're different, but most of the traffic's about the same. Your API servers, you know, they do different things, but it's all either REST or XML or something. It all looks the same. Our web servers, we have a Spanish language web server, we have a English language web server. They're different because that was how it was architected at, uh, many years ago, and that's what we have to support. The only difference between them is the language. The inbound requests are all the same, the outbound requests are different. So this is why we divided this up. Also, I want to share my rules between them. Again, this uh, let's block this bad guy who keeps attacking us. Let's share it between both of these WAFs. This dual WAF solution was also uh, implemented by somebody else, uh, a Brazilian uh, retail firm. And if you look on YouTube, you can actually find uh, them talking about it with Amazon uh, and how they did it. And uh, I implemented this, then I learned that they did the same thing too, and I never even knew about it. So the dual WAFs work, because people have discovered it independently. Now, what it looks like configured is this. You can see that we are sharing our rules between the API and the WWW systems. Uh, those reputation lists, the country level blacklists, I can share them all. But there are some rules that only apply to the web systems. Uh, that blacklisted um, orphaned endpoints thing that I mentioned earlier, that would be rule number six here. Uh, our API system, it doesn't use SQL, so why do I bother blocking SQL requests? It's just an extra rule I don't need. Now, we used to have a rule six on the API system, but we were able to make some changes to our API to have the need for that rule removed. So we just got rid of it because I don't need it, but I could always add it back. But you see 10 rules here, and then the default is allow, and this is how we configured it. Yours will be different, of course. Now, let's compare. I have less rule sets to manage. I only have to manage two now, whereas before I had to manage nine. I get shared rules. I didn't get them before. Uh, I still get my geo blocking, because the old solution had that too. But maximum 10 rules uh, per a rule set. And you saw on the previous slide, I used all 10. So I hit the maximum that Amazon's WAP allows, whereas my previous solution allowed more. Uh, regexes, you only get five total across everything. If that is a limitation for you, then you may not be able to use Amazon's WAF solution. Um, I recommend you do your research before you go really far down this rabbit hole. It's a good rabbit hole to go down, but make sure you don't code yourself into a corner. Uh, additionally, Amazon had uh, implemented a bad bot honeypot which we chose not to use. But there is the concept of a good bot rule too, uh, and Amazon security automation for the WAF does not support good bots. It's a different sort of um, logic that is not supported just yet. So we didn't get that, so maybe that's a phase two thing. So, okay, got all this, and that's the comparison between the two, but this entire talk is about security automation. I just talked about configuration here with the WAF. I didn't get into automation, but Things are automated, like the reputation lists and these bl other block blocking lists are all updated automatically. Uh, and the floods, the probes, it gets updated. And how does this work? What code do we have? It's Amazon's code. I didn't make any changes here. So everyone in this room can go and download it and implement it themselves. Uh, it works. And uh, we made um, some mostly static changes. We have our own little cloud formation Ansible scripts, and then we reordered a bunch of the rules and added regular expressions. So the only real change we made was speeding up the reputation list parser and speeding up the reputation list. So basically, I made it a lot faster. I removed the need for a rule, because remember we only had 10, and I removed the before you needed uh, two rules for this, and now we're down to one, so that makes it a little better for us. And Amazon will be incorporating this change in their next uh, release of the WAF Automation Security Toolkit. So I think I did your 
graph, I hope I did, is this, uh, you, uh, you got more. I do have more, but this is a great start, and I, I appreciate your efforts, Jay. But I still have one more concern uh, that we're going to talk about today, and that's when it comes to vulnerability management. We're all facing uh, that never-ending cycle of vulnerability management. We find vulnerabilities. How do we prioritize them to actually get them patched and remediated? Now that we are leveraging uh, Amazon's Inspector, how can we actually automate the remediation of the vulnerabilities that are found? Okay, so lots of vulnerabilities. And uh, we want to be com stay compliant. I would hope so, yes. Uh, okay. Yes, yes, okay. So you're asking for something little here yeah. is to uh, use Inspector. Well, we have Inspector. This is how it works if you've never seen it. Basically, you run an agent on your operating system. Uh, the agent continuously scans the operating system for vulnerabilities or configuration issues. Uh, as new vulnerabilities are discovered in the operating system, the agent gets updated and looks for this vulnerability. And all of this information gets sent off to the Amazon Inspector console, which collects it. And then eventually somebody looks and generates a big report of issues. Um, okay, that's pretty good. Now we need to be compliant with these various um, regulatory reasons here. And the way we do it is we go through Inspector, we look at the things, we divvy up the uh, bugs and uh, the vulnerabilities manually, and then we pass them to the correct teams to apply the patches to. Uh, and we have to prioritize, of course, by some, you know, sometimes you have to prioritize by HIPAA or the CIS guidelines. So this is all done manually, unfortunately. Sorry. Um, but, um, this room is also about new ideas. So what can we do to fix this? And an idea is like, let's continue with Inspector. It's a pretty good start. But um, instead of um, me having my minion go in and click generate report, let's um, have something automatically look at the findings and process them so that we get some sort of automation at this point. And then instead of... Um, um, you know, filing bug reports and patch requests and tickets to get things fixed. Why don't we have some sort of Amazon tool chain go ahead and patch the source AMI that we use to generate our EC2 instances? Okay, so now we've patched our, our, our AMIs, um, but we still have the vulnerable AMI is still running. It's still out there because we just found this issue. Well, Amazon's tool chain can also deploy a new AMI that has been patched and it will be added to our pool. And uh, remember, we use immutable technology. What do we do with a non-compliant AMI that's out there with vulnerabilities? Euthanize it, get rid of it, it's gone. And after it's gone, um, now we have a system running with a vulnerability fixed. Now remember, the agent auto updates, so it, this cycle will continue as a new vulnerability in the operating system is uh, done, is found. And so we will continuously upgrade and continuously be secure on our AMIs. Uh, but this is a little too hard to get done in a week that you asked me to finish it. Um, we need to take small steps to figure out how we can implement this as like a village here. We need to do this. So some of this can be done now. There are some commercial solutions that do little things, but we would like to leverage Amazon's own toolkit and own processes that they give us to patch these things so we don't need to go off to another third party and get yet another tool, yet another dashboard. Uh, we want this to be done. So Amazon's gives us these building blocks, and we think that we can start with the CIS and its checklist and the basic uh, operating system patches that come out. And we think we could actually do this. And I'm wondering if people in the room, maybe you guys think you can do this too and maybe we can all work together to raise the bar in security so that way we don't have to continuously patch things. We can hopefully get them to patch themselves. So the idea of this entire talk was automation and removing 
the manual workload that we've all have to do to make it so that we can tackle the harder problems. We want no more dashboards. Just stop alerting. Just let's have the systems fix themselves. And as we do all of this, it's going to eventually drive business enablement. That is correct. Um, security has grown up. It has matured. It has become that business enabler, right? And we need to get out of that form of depending on humans to read, you know, re read an alert and then actually fix something. We need to push forward. We want security to be very focused on helping the business continue to grow, just grow more securely. As AWS continues to evolve their tool set, um, we're going to continue to partner with them. We're going to continue to contribute uh, to Security as Code initiative. As AWS comes out with more security services, we're going to take advantage of those and test with them. We want to get incredibly creative with what we're doing. Uh, AWS has that slogan of build on. Us as security practitioners, we need to take that to heart. It's our turn to build on as well. We need to be building with these services. And speaking of that code, uh, it's out on GitHub. It's available for everyone. Jay? So please fork the code. Uh, please uh, submit enhancement requests. Uh, better yet, uh, submit patches with uh, all of your enhancements. Um, we'll look to share. Uh, we're going to be releasing new code over time. Um, we released something a few weeks ago at the AWS Loft in uh, New York City. And we're hoping to have more done uh, this spring. Thank oh. you very much for your time, guys. We appreciate yep. your, your attendance. We have some time for questions, if anybody has any questions. But here's our contact information as well. You could, but we wanted to uh, start using AWS native, and that's why we chose guard duty for this case. Uh, yeah, you could do exactly that with Splunk, yes. We are. We're starting to actually look at Kubernetes right now, uh, but we are using them in, in, in yeah. both areas. Yeah, the, the idea was that, that that's where we want to go and you know, building on Docker. We're gonna use Kubernetes, yes, Docker, yes, uh, but we, that's more of a where we would like to go in the future with, the, with this sort of thing. And hey, if you can help us implement it, that'd be great. Um, so we'll be, I will be speaking at RSA this spring on other security topics, so if anyone's there, uh, definitely talk to, talk to you guys there. Uh, I do blog occasionally about security. Brian tweets a lot about security, uh, so you can follow us on the intertubes and internets, and more importantly, I have non-security Instagram. That's much more fun. Um, but uh, you know, we'll be here for the rest of the day if you guys have questions. Yeah, a few um, more questions. Even afterwards? Yeah, yeah, come on. What's up? Um, uh, for the, the gap or omitting piece of the inspector puzzle that you threw out in the last couple slides there, do you think that automating that step against the list is the way to go, or is something like ML detecting what you guys are doing or what you're doing? Well, I think both, yes. honestly. Yeah. Because if, like, inspector's going to say you're missing this patch. This patch means the way to fix it is a you know patch fix miss that so that would definitely be the list thing. Uh, for some of the other reasons, ML that was a bit more of an advanced topic, but yeah, we be not today, but uh, start with the list part. But that would be cool, yes. But I like your thought process. Yeah, absolutely like your thought. You're thinking differently out of the box, and that's what we want with security as code. Yeah. Not being just in that old mentality of the doing the same thing, right? So I appreciate that thought process of looking at, at different technology to solve this problem. Right? Yeah. Great talk. Um, how do you keep from uh, putting specific parameters like bad network ports out of your uh, Lambda function co code? So for uh, some of the functions we're actually doing um, environment variables that get set in Ansible to get configured, and if they want to change that, they change it, and then they redeploy everything. Uh, the 
bad port code is hard coded right now because I been a bit busy and I haven't fixed it. But for the S3 bucket one, that's massive amounts of Ansible uh, with environment variables. We haven't published the Ansible part yet because it's way too um, specific to our network, but the environment variable part is definitely there. Uh, ideally, for a future design, go call off to a DynamoDB, go look up what the ports are, and then do the check. I think that would be the future. Uh, I just wanted to get the quick, the quick win in this case. Have you run into any situation in the port, uh, the port example where it's, let's say we want to configure it not just open to the internet, but you want to make sure that there's uh, CIDR blocks that are whitelisted, but then you also want to have non-good uh, ports that you still want to protect even with the whitelisted CIDRs for whatever reason. Uh, have you run into any situations where you still want to have exceptions to those rules and then you realize that um, you're blocking some release because uh, of your Lambda automation, now you have to go back and change the Lambdas? No, we haven't, but I'm sure there will be a day when that will happen. Um, how do we solve it? Well, I'm... I don't know. I'm of the opinion that uh, they really need to document these things. Why are you opening up sensitive ports so often uh, and that they should be coming to security first before we get that far? And then we can modify the code to allow them to do it. Uh, but ideally, a giant configuration block would be good for what ports to allow, what networks to allow. That would be ideal. Uh, but for us, the goal was no what, net, what's the, what network are you going to use? Minus one or zero, 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 zero. That was the goal because that is the biggest uh, case that I've seen both somebody being lazy at our company and uh, somebody being lazy at other companies to just get a port open. Hey, submit a patch. Yeah, talk louder. <laughs> Uh, we, it's mostly the security team writing this security on top of it to help. So you make uh, security professionals uh, programming as a... Yeah, and if, if we would outsource if we have trouble uh, with, with some of the more comp complicated code to the developers to help. Now, we also do, I mean, not part of this talk, but we also work directly with developers like we have our own application code. Part of our job is... Uh, I have a design question, I have a security question, what sort of code do we use? And then we use code tools on top of everything. Uh, like we bake in security to at least our CI CD environment, we bake in some security um, tools like, um, I won't use vendor names, uh, but into the AMI. So it's slightly different than our production AMI, but when the code runs, it's a um, interactive, um, IAST, Interactive Application Security. I know what tool. You know that tool, okay. Yeah. Uh, to, to give us uh, results. So we bake security in there, we work directly. So, um, you know, this talk was just this and writing code to hopefully fix security without buying a lot of vendor stuff. But we do a lot more as a uh, security team at ZocDoc than just uh, the stuff that was discussed today. Okay, and to piggyback on top of that, you, you asked about security and developers. We actually do train all of our developers. They all go through no, uh, secure yeah, code training. No, that part I understand, but you also do the reverse part, like uh, the security professionals to do the coding part. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Any other questions? More? Yeah. That's a great question. So right now we're currently six. Currently sure. six. Uh, and from the moment we actually scoped out uh, doing the work for High Trust, uh, which we did shortly after achieving our SOC 2 Type 2, we figured we were pretty much close enough. We had to do a few more things. Uh, to the moment we actually got our High Trust certification, probably about eight to nine months. And aren't we like one of the only dot com -y types with High Trust? With it's high mostly trust. hospitals and health systems are insurance and we're you know not any of those the toughest part about getting the high trust certification was explaining AWS security controls to the auditor because the auditor like if you look at controls for audits they're designed for bare metal you know bare metal technology and data centers so explaining to them what an AMI was is 
That took the longest. So if you want to get your .com high trust certified, okay, well, yeah. we, just, we just made your life easier because now they understand AWS, so you're you welcome. So, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we did it as, uh, so, so the CloudWatch event configuration, uh, I put JSON on the screen because to me that makes more sense uh, visually. Uh, but for some of them we did it manually, just you know, typed it in. But uh, we do. We have it ansibleized uh, in other in, in other environments. So the the code box a file on disk, and it magically goes up there after, when our uh, SRE team runs it. So a little of both in, in this case. But for testing purposes, oh, do it manually. Uh, and ideally, for most of those things, you do it once. You don't need to keep redeploying um, the rules. Any other questions? Thanks for your time, guys. Have a Thank good night. You.